So what can we do with genomes now that we can read them, now that we're starting to have the book of life? Well, there's many things. Some are exciting. Some people will find very scary. I will tell you a couple of things that will probably make you want to projectile puke on me, but that's okay. Um, so, you know, we now can learn the history of, org uh, of organisms. You can do a very simple test, scrape your cheek, send it off. You can find out where your relatives come from. You can do your genealogy going back thousands of years. We can understand functionality. This is really important. We can understand, for example, why we create plaque in our arteries, um, what creates the starchiness inside of a grain, um, why does yeast um, metabolize sugar and produce carbon dioxide. We can also look at, at a grander scale, what creates problems, what creates disease, and how we may be able to fix them. Because we can understand this, we can fix them, make better organisms. Most importantly, what we're learning is that nature has provided us a spectacular toolbox. The toolbox exists. Uh, an architect far be better and smarter than us has given us that toolbox, and we now have the ability to use it. We are now not just reading genomes, we are writing them. This company, Synthetic Genomics, I'm involved with, created the first full synthetic genome for a little bug, a very primitive creature called Mycoplasma genitalium. If you have a UTI, you've probably or had, ever had a UTI, you've, you've come in contact with this little bug. Very simple, only has about 246 genes, but we were able to completely synthesize that genome now you have the genome and you say to yourself, so if I plug the synth synthetic genome, if I pull the old one out and plug it in, does it just boot up and live? Well, guess what? It does. Not only does it do that, if you took the genome, that synthetic genome, and you plugged it into a different critter like yeast, you now turn that yeast into mycoplasma. It's sort of like booting up a PC with a Mac OS software. Well, actually, you could do it the other way. So, you know, it, it, by, by being able to write a genome and plug it into an organism, the software, if you will, changes the hardware. And this is extremely profound. So, last year, the French and Italians announced they got together and they went ahead and they sequenced Pinot Noir. The genomic sequence now exists for the entire Pinot Noir organism. Um, they identified, once again, about 29,000 genes. They have discovered pathways that create flavors, although it's very important to understand that those compounds that it's cranking out have to match a receptor in our genome and in our tongue for us to understand and interpret those flavors. They've also discovered that there's a heck of a lot of um, activity going going on producing aroma as well. They've identified areas of vulnerability to disease. They now are understanding, and the work is going on, exactly how this plant works. And we have the capability to know, to read that entire code and understand how it ticks. So then what do you do? Knowing we can read it, knowing that we can write it, change it, maybe write its genome from scratch. So what do you do? Well, one thing you could do is what some people might call Frankenoir. Um, <laughs> we can build a better vine. By the way, just so you know, you, you get stressed out about genetically modified organisms. There is not one single vine in this valley or anywhere that is not genetically modified. They are not grown from seeds. They're grafted into rootstock. They would not exist in nature on their own. So don't worry about Don't stress about that stuff. We've been doing this forever. So we could, you know, focus on disease resistance. We can go for higher yields without necessarily having dramatic farming techniques to do it or cost. We could conceivably expand the climate window. We could make Pinot Noir grow um, maybe in Long Island, God forbid. Um, <clears throat> We could produce better flavor, flavors and aromas. You want a little more raspberry, a little more chocolate here or there. Um, all of these things could conceivably be done, and I will tell you, I'd pretty much bet that it will be done. But there's an ecosystem here. In other words, we're not sort of unique little organisms running around. We are part of a big ecosystem. In fact, 
I'm sorry to inform you that inside of your digestive tract is about 10 pounds of microbes, which you're circulating through your body quite a bit. Um, our oceans teeming with microbes. In fact, um, when Craig Venter went and sequenced uh, the microbes in the ocean in the first three months, tripled the known species on the planet. By discovering all new microbes in the first 20 feet of water, we now understand that those microbes have more impact on our climate and regulating CO2 and oxygen than plants do, which we always thought oxygenate the atmosphere. We find microbial life in every part of the planet, in ice, in coal, in, in rocks, in, in um, uh, volcanic vents. It's an amazing thing. Um, but we've also discovered when it comes to plants, in plants, as much as we understand and are starting to understand their genomes, it is the ecosystem around them. It is the microbes that live in their root systems that have just as much impact on the character of those plants as the metabolic pathways of the plants themselves. If you take a closer look at a root system, you will find there are many, many, many diverse microbial colonies this is not big news to viticulturists. They have been, you know, concerned with water and fertilization. And again, this is sort of my um, notion of shit against the wall, wall pharmacology. You know, certain fertilizers make the plant more healthy, so you put more in. Um, you don't necessarily know at, with granularity exactly what organisms are providing what flavors and, and what characteristics. We can start to figure that out. We all talk about terroir, we worship terroir, we say, wow, is my terroir great. It's so special. I've got this piece of land and it creates terroir like you wouldn't believe. Well, we, you know, we, we really, we argue and debate about it. We say it's climate, it's soil, it's this. Well, guess what? We can figure out what the heck terroir is. It's in there waiting to be sequenced. There are thousands of microbes there. They're easy to sequence. Unlike a human, they you know, have 1,000, 2,000 genes. We can figure out what they are. All we have to do is go around and sample, um, dig, dig into the ground, find those bugs, sequence them, correlate them to the kinds of characteristics we like and don't like. That's just a big database. And then fertilize. And then we understand what is terroir. So some people will say, oh my God, are we playing God? Are we now, if we engineer organisms, are we um, playing God? And you know, people would always ask James Watson, he's not always the most politically correct guy, um, <laughs> and they would say, uh, are, you know, are you playing God? And he had the best answer I ever heard to this question. Well, somebody has to. <laughs> Um, I consider myself a very spiritual person and uh, without, you know, the organized religion part. And I, and I will tell you, I don't believe there's anything unnatural. Um, I don't believe that chemicals are unnatural. I told you I'm going to make some of you puke. Um, it's very simple. We don't invent molecules, compounds. They're here. They're in the universe. We reorganize things. We change them around. But we don't make anything unnatural. Now, we can create bad impacts. We can poison ourselves. We can poison the earth. But that's just a natural outcome of a mistake we made. Um, so what's happening today is nature is presenting us with a toolbox. And we find that this toolbox is very extensive. There are microbes out there that actually make gasoline, believe it or not. There are microbes, you know, go back to yeast. These are chemical factories. The most sophisticated chemical factories are provided by nature. And... We now can use those. Um, there also is a set of rules. Nature will not allow you to... We could engineer a great plant, but guess what? We can't make the great plant produce babies. Um, nature has put a set of rules out there. Um, we can work within the rules. We can't break the rules. We're just learning what the rules are. I just asked the question, if you could cure all disease... If you could make disease go away, because we understand how it actually works. If we could end hunger by being able to create nutritious, healthy plants that grow in, in very hard-to-grow environments. Um, if we could create clean and plentiful energy, we, right in the labs at Synthetic Genomics, have single-celled organisms that are taking carbon dioxide and producing a molecule very similar to gasoline. So... Carbon dioxide, the stuff we want to get rid of, not sugar, not anything, carbon dioxide, a little bit of sunlight, you end up with a uh, lipid 
that um, is highly refined. We could solve our energy problems. We can reduce CO2. We could clean up our oceans. We could make better wine. If we could, would we? Well, you know, I think the answer is very simple. Working with nature, working with this tool set that we now understand is the next step in humankind's evolution. And all I can tell you is stay healthy for 20 years. If you can stay healthy for 20 years, you'll see 150, maybe 300. Thank you. Thank you.